when I moved to Condé Nast, I said, okay, if we're going to rebuild the whole system, it's a publishing company, and they have Bo, uh, GQ, Wire, and all that, and you need, to so you need to have a new CMS, and you need to have a new front end, and each individual Vogue, each individual GQ, and each individual website has their own, is connected to a different CMS, and it has its own, you know, um, ecosystem, and you need to bring everything together, you have to think about what is the core. And in here, it means what are the key templates or pages that people actually uh, interact with? Is it the galleries? Is it an article page? Is it long form pages? So, and by understanding that, you also need to understand core as in what is the core, but also what is the effect of the core. So is the core something that is completely functional? Is the core something that it's more, or, or the core is, um, say, uh, related to, uh, for example, in the case of um, Condé Nast, you could say the core is a template, so the article the, or the gallery, but actually a template on its own doesn't work. It needs to be integrated with advertisement platforms. So is like how big is, is the core? Is it just one thing or, or multiple? Um, but the, um, the only way you could start is just asking, realizing that you need to understand what is the core. Because if you just get, get it on your first day, you're like, okay, where do I start? Um, I mean, that's one approach. You can also start by just talking to people and understanding problems. So that, that would be the other, other, um, other way I would, I would do that. Um, for example, if you join uh, a company and they give you a product, and if on the first week you realize that you have a backlog of a lot of bugs, or suddenly you get pinged by a lot of people like, hey, this is broken, or hey, when are you going to fix this? I would go a step back and be like, okay, first of all, why we have so many things that are broken, and that sometimes it's just, a, I don't know, my experience has been a byproduct of lack of communication, or developers not necessarily understanding what is the problem that needed to be solved. So maybe someone said, do this this way, and they were like, okay, okay, fine, I'll do it this way, but actually broke something next, something on the other side because they didn't know that was connected, things like that. Um, but if you have a, so if this is the case, if you join a team and, you know, also interview and talk to your engineers uh, to see, I always ask the question, like, what would you like to fix? What would you like to improve? What are the things that's causing you mo the most painful uh, as part of your development? Like, what are the things that are really painful? By understanding that, then you can be like, okay, either if something is really, really broken, you need to assess if you want to spend more time trying to fix that, or if it's better to try and maintain this like low touch, <laughs> something like that, and then maybe build something in parallel that can uh, maybe address the need even better. So having a backlog full of bugs not necessarily means that you need to go and try fix. You need to understand that there is something um, there that you should tackle first because what tends to happen is, okay, I'm going to try, you know, somehow fix the bugs, but they are going to keep coming and they're going to keep kind of interacting, uh, interrupting the development process. So and I know this sounds very obvious, and I, yeah, to me I was like, yeah, of course we need to fix the bugs, but really pay attention to the ones that are, um, that are constantly popping up, not necessarily the same bug, but on the same area. So in, in my case, for example, it could be, uh, I don't know, problems with uh, the ordering flow. When people want to order, maybe the order doesn't go through. And Sure, it's a critical thing, and maybe we put a patch or something, move, you know, continue with development. But if it's in a critical area, and if then you have a problem, maybe not on the bottom, but you have a problem with, I don't know, the settings of, of that page. Yeah, I would try and be like, can we just look around what's, what's, what's happening on, on, this, um, on this area and probably either, you know, rethink can we just build something in the meantime and then we can migrate and, sh and shift? Or, you know, what's the point of building features on top of something that is broken? So I, I always, I know that sometimes it's hard to have the convers conversation, especially with, if you are new to a company, you cannot be, like, I mean, you can, definitely you can be like, listen, it's my first day and I know this is broken, we need to fix it. I mean, you, if you have enough context, 
do it. Um, but I will definitely spend more time trying to understand what are the underlying co causes of something like that. Um, I don't know, my experience has been mostly people, but not necessarily because there are people there. It's, it's a misunderstanding on, uh, of what the feature is, but also what's the goal of that system or that screen or that product or that specific flow. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one that I will try try do if I get a lot of bugs. What are you using Agile? Um, yeah, I have a particular view on Agile. Um, so I have read almost all the books. I have seen a lot of videos about it. I mean, I really like to consume information. And I am not a dogmatic person with Agile. So I try to, so for me, it's very important to just to see the context, right? So if I join a team, that's why I will try to understand the, even the different styles of people that you have in the team. Because in the end, people, they are the ones developing the product. So if you don't see that your team is working very well, probably your product is not gonna perform very well. I'm not saying that this is the standard for every product, but if you see that a product is broken, you can trace back and yeah, miscommunication or something like that. So back to your question about Agile, it is another tool so I think like the method, they have different methodologies. So I would say if you have a team, for example, if you have a team that they always work at startups and they, you, no one from the team has worked in a big company and you come from a big company, it's dangerous. You, you're like, okay, we're going to have all the, you know, all the ceremonies and like daily standups and like just right away because you don't know if that's needed. So you can take things like what is what is very interesting is like you can take the goal of of or, or what each method is trying to achieve and you can say okay how this can be fit into this team so for example if you have a, a team of developers that they have been always working in silo and they have been always fixing stuff and be super reactive and they might be very tired of that uh, situation you can say okay what about if we start working on one thing all together? You can still, like, it depends on the situation, no? but you can say, okay, we, this is one of the projects in which we are gonna work together and we're gonna have maybe a regular catch up every, every two days or something like that. You keep it very light because you could understand that the, the or you can understand that the whole day to day cannot be shifted right away to, okay, now everyone drop that and everyone does this and that, like, um, Another thing would be trying to understand how, like, what kind of, um, what kind of developer or engineer wor works with you. So sometimes you have people that they like to just think about the problem more and other people, they really like to um, execute and they prefer to, to kind of being told what, necessarily what to do, but like very, very, very clear with the, as, um, non, not acceptance criteria, but something like, okay, this is what we expect this feature to do, and this is the scenario in which this feature is used, or the user flows, or something like that. Other people are really, really drawn into, oh, I want to, you know, just tell me the problem and tell me what success, success looks like, and that's the one that they will be, uh, I mean, if you understand what is the balance, if you have a team full of people that they really want every single story or they need to know exactly how to implement something. You as a product manager, you need to understand this context so that you can either tailor or change their approach a bit if, you, if that doesn't match with your uh, you know, way of working. Or, um, or you can, um, I don't know, flex your style and be more, okay, I'm gonna start writing down the tickets in more detail, for example. Um, in my experience, things that uh, were very, very tough for me, it was working with a team that was very mixed. So, some, so the, sometimes we had developers that were like, "No, I don't, I don't, I don't care about like the, the, the whole problem and the massive thing. I really want to know what is the thing that I really need to implement." And but they were working with a person that was more like, "Oh no, no, I, I, don't tell me exactly what to do. I want to just have my, you know, kind of." Uh, what, what is the problem? Why we need to solve this? And what are the metrics? 
So what I tried to do in that situation was <laughs> have, I had like a meeting every Friday in which I will discuss, like try to please both audiences in a way that it was effective also for me to hear back what would be the issues if we went to that experimentation line. So trying to, to hear uh, that, but also explaining, okay, listen, uh, we saw, so I would go and drop all the, all the stats, <laughs> like we saw this is what's happening in the part of the product or this is what is important to solve. And usually, another thing that I learned is that if you go with options, if you, it depends on your team and also the autonomy that you have. But I like to go with, uh, to the teams with options, like, hey, we have these two big problems or these three big problems. Which one do we think we need to tackle first? Or which one do you think um, would you like to tackle first? Or, so by giving them options, you also, uh, you're given the options that you think are gonna either, even if they pick the number three, that is gonna be impactful for, for the product. So, yeah. How could the developer know what is the business value it's going to deliver? That's, but that's your, that, a good program manager, or in my experience, people that I, I'm like, I really admire, is people that can bring all the context uh, to, the, to the developers without bombarding them. So how they know, how they know if they are being successful with what they do, is every time you deploy, say, a new feature, an experiment, or you do a product launch or something new, if you're able to feed back to them what was the result, that uh, closes the loop and that gets them excited. Um, because it's kind of like, okay, I'm not just launching things live, I actually have an impact, good one or a bad one, I don't know. Um, but if you don't, if you don't, you don't do that, then I think it's harder than as a program manager to be like, hey, this is the most important thing. They're going to be, yeah, uh -huh, mm -hmm, yeah, you see this data, but how can I actually, you know, is it is it really important? So, uh, good practice would be to, when you launch something, go back to, hey, this is what happened, or this is the effect. So, for example. Um, Last week, we, uh, there was a tiny thing that we needed to solve for the operations team. The operations team is a team that we have in-house, so it's a small team. So, you know, if you, this developer did a change in the, in the code just to make their life a bit easier, so just to automate some stuff. So I went back to the ops team, like, hey, now if you do these things on Slack, it does all this stuff for you, and you can, you know, you will save maybe half an hour from, from each thing or each task. And they were like, oh my God, this is great. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> you know, that was the reaction of that tiny change. And I, I went back to, the, to this developer and said, hey, listen, this is what they were saying. And he was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's quite good. So, okay, it's a tiny feedback loop, but being able to say, this is what you did and this was what was the impact also a strength, um, makes your relationship with them a bit more uh, or stronger, just a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, then present it to the team. Okay, how does the team know which one to pick? What is the value that they're going to solve? It depends how you frame it. So if I say, okay, we have a problem with the sign it, uh, say, login flow, and if you if we solve this problem, we're going to affect uh, sorry, eighty percent of the users, and that's the data I can see, right? And if I say problem B is uh, upper funnel, so this is more with offers, and we want to work with the, I don't know, offers team to integrate their API so that we can show the most relevant offer for you. So you have two, two, two experiments. So one experiment is, for example, changing the login flow. So we improve, uh, the metric would be, say, logins, imagine. And that will affect 80% of users. However, if we work with the offers team, we can affect, uh, say, I don't know, like 20% of the users, but we can also um, impact this amount in the business. So I just bring more data. I know that both things might be, so are good for, for the product, and I know both will have a benefit. But I need to frame it in a way that they understand. If you work on problem A, solving problem A, you're going to affect, this is going to be the impact. If you work on problem B, this is going to be the impact. Um, also, you can think about, the, not necessarily, 
So not everything is going to be quantitative data. You can also say, well, we did uh, user research and we understood that, I don't know, the um, uh, first order flow or the first booking flow is very painful. And within that flow, these are the areas that are really, really painful. Which ones do we think we can tackle now versus maybe in a month's time? Which ones are, you know, logical order? So maybe you cannot tackle, you know, the last part if you don't tackle the first one. So that's the, it's kind of like, you need to frame it. You need to tell them in advance, like, what is the, what is the impact? Hopefully you know what is the impact as well, or you have an estimation of the, of the impact. If you don't have a lot of data, then you need to either uh, try to get it from somewhere else uh, or have proxies. So that would be one. Well, the other thing was the approach. So in general, what I would suggest is when you, for example, when you think that you cannot, um, so when you have a bunch of, say, developers, engineers, copywriters, uh, even people from different roles in the company, I don't know, marketing, uh, sales, and you're trying to talk about a problem that you want to solve or a feature that you need to implement, if you don't believe in that feature, like, <laughs> I don't know, use it more as a cue, like, okay, why am I having such a hard time to justify to my own team that we should build this? Um, why? Because that's, that might be a signal as to maybe we need to rethink this a bit or maybe this is not the right thing to do. So this, I, well, I got this, especially when I was working uh, at, at the very beginning of my career. It, sometimes I had, in, I had a product in which, uh, so, so for the user, the product was a bit broken because for the client, the product was more a marketing channel, but for the user was their actual product to go and commute around across London. So I was having, I had a really, really hard time to uh, justify to my team, like, oh no, let's not fix this. Let's just put, let's just change the UI uh, or let's spend more time uh, you know, tweaking the way the, say, the icon looks and rather than actually fixing uh, other part of the code, which was going to take more time, which I needed to then go back to the person I was working for to ask for more budget. So, but I had a really hard time to justify to my team that, yeah, we need to spend more time on, on the icons rather than like, well, we should work more on the API side of things. So that would be one approach. So if you are in a meeting, with your team and you're discussing a backlog or you're discussing stories or you're, disc I don't know the, the way that you uh, like to work, but if you're having a hard time to justify something, that's a signal for you to maybe go back and, and <coughs> rethink what's the, you know, what's the feeling that, that you, why you have that feeling. Um, also because depending on the, con um, not the country, but depending on the company, that that, you know, not being able to quickly, not quickly, but like justify your thought can actually harm the progress of that feature. So I remember at some point um, at Booking, I was somehow convinced that if I use some APIs to um, offer more ways for people to log in, I would increase the chances of people logging in. So I was like, oh, maybe we can integrate with a lot of APIs, I don't know, depending on, on the platforms, say, BK in Russia or Line in Japan, so they have a lot of APIs, so you can use it as a sign login, uh, kind of like a different login flow. But I was not quite sure that if that was the right approach. For example, are are we um, are our is our product at the core very secure? Is the data very secure? Is it? Like, I, I was at that point. I didn't feel like I had all those answers. So. When I presented to the team, like, oh yeah, let's integrate with, you know, VK API and Line API and all these things. Because I was not quite sure about it. <laughs> they were like, like, why though? And I'm like, well, you know, because we have all this, uh, you know, the traffic from all these countries, because we have, this is the, you know, the est impact if we do so, estimation of the impact. And, but because I was not necessarily sure, they could, See, so they, they were like, mm, okay, but what about the other problem? And I was like, okay, you know what? I cannot uh, justify this. So I said, okay, let's park it for now. And after like two months, we implemented it. But, but yeah, so if you are in a situation in which you cannot 
completely you, you it's not necessarily about your thought process It's maybe if you don't feel that that's the right thing to do at that time just step back for a second and then uh, you can continue um, the other thing about the approach is um, I don't know how to for example how to deal with uh, Older people that might not know what product management is, and this is very common. I don't know, has been very, very common for me, except for for booking. But when I joined Condé Nast or when I was working for TFL or Ford, um, the the concept of a product manager was so dif different or distant of what they had in mind that sometimes uh, people would think that I was a project manager, that or that I was a marketing person, or that I, I was uh, I don't know like. It was mostly those two roles. So people would come to me like, hey, can you uh, tell me when things are gonna be done? And I, I mean, I can report on delivery, on expectations, things like that. But I was like, hmm, I think you're not getting my <laughs> job right. But, uh, um, and the other one, so the other thing was like the, the marketing part is like, hey, what about, what do you think about the social media strategy that we should have? And I'm like, I mean, I can't comment on these things, but this is not necessarily what the product, the product that we are building is about. So what I would suggest in these cases is to, I mean, it depends on if you can do this, but to start bringing those people to maybe your conversations with the team or to um, sit in with them while you look through the data so that they understand that, okay, she's is not, she is not the, the person that is just controlling the timelines, because it's like, no. <laughs> but they get a sense of, okay, she, they get a sense of how to work with you as well. Because for example, with uh, the sales team at Condé Nast, I work with them a lot in terms of how you, do you sell Vogue? How do you sell GQ? How do you sell, um, because in the end, I'm developing that product, so how do you sell it? And I learned a lot about how they promise things to maybe the advertisers because they think, oh yeah, it's going to be done. And, and then by talking to them and by working with them, then, then realize, oh, okay, wait, so there's a whole process to get, say, the banners showing the, the client's uh, ads, for example. Um, so it's not that they are uh, dumb or stupid or things like that. No, it's more like by bringing them and by you talking to them in a regular basis, then you kind of see each other's uh, worlds. That would be one. And also try sell your product. That's uh, something that gives you a lot of uh, insight as to how people react. And I know that maybe you are not in a position to go and try to sell your product, maybe yes, but if you have an opportunity to go, if it's something like a B2B product, try go to a meeting with a potential client and you try sell that product. Um, I know that, for example, for Condé Nast, I talk a lot with um, product managers from Google, and they are there trying to sell new features or new integrations and things like that. And that, to me, uh, I felt like that was a good, um, I would say, a good practice from their side as well, because they have even more knowledge. Uh, but yeah, uh, the other one would be ops, the operations part if you can work with at least a week or at least even a day, if you can sit down next to someone that's doing the customer success, customer support, that role, if you can sit next to, to them, then you, get, you, you will get a better sense of what's going on with your product when people are using it. I know that you know, if you have tracking and if you have you know, all the data structure in a way that you can analyze it, that's good. But if you sit next to one operations person, then you will see even how they solve the problems. So that's another way. And by doing that, they can also learn from, okay, why you're even sitting next to me. And then you can kind of educate like, okay, well, I'm the person that, because I'm developing the product, I need to know what's going on with the users. And because they feel like, oh, okay, so that's okay. If, if something comes up, can I feedback to you? If you're in a startup, you could say, yeah, I mean, talk to me. If you're in a big company, well, maybe there are other ways of uh, communicating. Um, so yeah, so try sell your product. Try support your product as a support uh, person. That will give you a lot of feedback. And um, 
The other thing in terms of approach to uh, say new, even new products could be um, how, I mean, you can look at the competition and that's fine because if you want to look at the competition and if you want to understand how other people uh, are solving their product, I would say do so. Um, but maybe there's some an, an interesting angle that you can take, which is, okay, what, because people tend to look at Facebook and Google and they are, to be honest, like in all verticals, so yeah. But you can also take the angle of, okay, what, if we think that this, this is a big problem or for that, uh, for that user, what is the, um, what is the first, like what are the benefits that I can uh, kind of, what are the benefits that I can show to them as a you know, quick experimentation? But also what, uh, yeah, it's kind of like, how can I measure this in a way that I can quickly get the, the results? And then can I sit down with the team and can, can we start building towards that? And I know it sounds a bit obvious, but you don't need to look at what Facebook and Google are doing. They do provide the, say, if they do provide the standard experience. So you do need to understand what is the standard. But it's not necessarily that you need to follow that standard. So you can be smart about it. That means that, for example, if I'm developing a product that is chat, it's a chat, uh, chat app, yes, for sure, I will look at different chat apps in the market. But do I need to go and try to do the same just for the sake of, oh, yeah, it's, it's a chat app? Or can I understand how can I leverage that standard to my own product? So that would be uh, other one. Um, the, <laughs> the other thing that I wanted to ask you is how, what would be like, what has been the most um, kind of hard or complex situation you have had in terms of approaching uh, a, a product? To have. Um, yeah, convincing everyone that that core is the same. So you mentioned the onion. It was kind of going to be a question, but I felt you kept getting asking questions when you were trying to go through your presentation there. It's just that some, a lot of people might perceive the core of the onion as something different, especially in B2B where each person is responsible for a client that mm -hmm. cares a lot more about a certain element of your product. Okay, so thank you. So Right. And how, 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 what, I mean, how are you trying to solve that, for example? <laughs> I'm trying, I'm not doing very well at the minute. Um, it's ultimately keep bringing people back to the question of whether or not we all know what the, the true value of the product is. Okay. And if we have to keep asking that question for six months, we're going to keep asking that question. Okay. And what, um, I mean, why, would you, why do you think there is uh, such a, like, okay, people are not maybe agreeing on this stuff. Like, why, why do you think that that is the case? In our example, it's because of the business model that we have and the fact that we have account managers for every customer. So each customer's got a voice and each account manager has a voice for the customer and we have probably a bit too much, or the account managers have too much say in the product itself. Right. Um, so, okay. Probably, yeah. How was it with Booking.com? How was it convincing people that access was the core? Yeah, so um, at Booking, they, uh, the thing is every team is kind of um, responsible for something that can be measured or they, they organize the teams in such a way that they are independent enough to try work on something, even if they are part of a bigger, uh, say, department. So you could say, well, you have a, say, the, the um, convert team or the team focusing only on conversion but then they try to break it down in such a way that okay if you're focusing on the hotel page that's your focus and you can do whatever you want there but then you need to try convince so the conversation is more around what line of experimentation you can do that brings the most value and what line of experimentations other people might like uh, be really really interested on following up because sometimes and that, that, that's how they um, you know, spread their own kind of knowledge, I would say. So for example, if you have a really successful experiment by changing the copy on the hotel page, other team will be like, hmm, wait a second, if you change the word here, and this is actually increasing conversion, can I try this on my own uh, product? So they will go and try that. 
Um, so the conversations are kind of this, uh, like this, or, or you have the other part, which is more the conflict, which is conflicting metrics. So for example, if you have, if you're working on the conversion funnel, you care about people just booking, right? Like I don't care about what happens after, I mean, you can care as a person, but say in terms of metrics and things like that, okay, you are optimizing for getting more bookings. And then what happens is when the, the user or a person books uh, an hotel, then they enter another part of the business, which is the you know, post-booking experience, or uh, you could say retention or engagement and all that. And those are trying to optimize for retention, or they're trying to optimize for less number of tickets created, and things like that. Sometimes you would have teams that are trying to get more conversion, like more bookings, and it doesn't matter how, so they, they can do that. And then maybe one of the experiments is a change of a copy, and it says, say, book for free. And then in tiny, you know, copies like, pay when you stay. That, what happens is you, as a team, you're like, oh my God, we're driving conversion up. But in the other side of the business, you get product managers like, what's going on with customer support? We're get, getting like, I don't know, 10,000 tickets per day, even more than that. Like, what's going on? And then that's where you have the debate, yeah? So how do you build a roadmap then for your part of the product, given you have so many competing uh, metrics? Uh, yeah, good question. That's when you need uh, something that is maybe above that layer, as in layer, you know, above, okay, the, the, those individual teams. And that's where companies tend to have kind of overarching goals. Uh, some companies tend to have the OKRs as a method or as a way of a framework to drive all these teams together. Um, or you try, yeah, it's kind of organized. It could be KPIs, not necessarily objectives with more KPIs, but you do need, when you have this setup, like individual teams doing uh, things on their own, you do need to have either KPIs, goals, uh, or, or joint metrics, um, and kind of like understanding why this is important. But at Booking, for example, they introduced OKRs when I joined, and they were kind of experiment with uh, setting the OKRs, and it, it's, you know, it's hard to get the cadence right because for a big company to get OKRs, they need to actually start, say, a quarter before. So it's always the game of catching up and planning ahead. But they were, so they were doing OKRs as a company, more like, what are the company's priorities? So, well, this year we want to do these three things or four things. So they're really, really big, uh, or I say, uh, I think like, not necessarily big, but wide. So. We want to say, we want to improve uh, the experience of the, the booking experience. We want to go to China. We want to go to the US, for example. So they have these massive uh, goals. And then you get now the following thing is, OK, how each department is going to contribute. So well, marketing, they're going to work on promoting booking.com in the US doing these things. Um, and then you have like tech, they're going to focus on this part of the of the priorities. So you start kind of breaking the, the big goal down. And then you have different approaches there as well, because you have people saying, well, you know, management only defines the big things. And then each team will go and try find the best way of, the, you know, try and find the way to contribute to that. Or uh, then you have another approach, which is you like management will define everything and then uh, people will try kind of like organize the teams accordingly. So which one works the, the best? I think, well, I really enjoy working at Booking and uh, for example, Reiki, I really enjoy having the freedom of, of understanding where do we want to go and then defining the OKR for my team, with my team <laughs> uh, or my teams, depending on the setup. And that's, I think it's a good exercise I would never underestimate the time it takes because you do need to understand what you really want to do uh, and how, you know, if you pick the wrong metrics, you're going to maybe halfway the, the quarter, you, you're like, why are we even doing this? Like, why are we even, you know, optimizing for logins when actually 
is not logging is what is driving the most impact f to get to this goal. So, um, so that would be that would be one. That's yeah. <laughs> Understand that, like, this is not what you should do. You just cancel this project, change the the test to do, and just uh, change the KPIs for yourself, or what is the problem? Uh, for, for what? For I, mean, I mean, you just mentioned, like, okay, so you've been doing something, like optimizing login. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For like for two months. And yeah. You understand, like, this is not the the best way to to, to hit your KPIs. Mm -hmm. And you find it another way. So you just cancel login uh, work. Well, well, if you're gonna, for, uh, so for example, if you're gonna completely cancel, I mean, sometimes you do need to be that aggressive and be like, stop this, just. Uh, but uh, where you can just face out the the work, so you could say, well, actually, I can give you a concrete example. I at the beginning uh, in accounts, I was like, you know, signups was one of the KPIs. We needed to bring more signups. And it was the focus for, say, six months. We were trying to get people to sign up and in different parts of the products. And you, know, you book your, your holiday, sorry, your, your, well, your holiday with your hotel. And it's like, create your account to manage your booking. And like, create your account here, here, here. And the thing is, OK, fine. Those experiments were positive in the sense that they were driving signups. But then we realized that the actual benefit of signing up in terms of metrics was not signing up, but actually confirming your your account confirming that you own that email address or that phone number so the verification of that sign up was the valuable thing because if that was the case then the hotel could talk to you we could actually reach out if there were issues um, you could actually go and change your primary email and have a secondary one so and also, in terms of security, it was a, an extra layer to protect your, your, your account and recover access. So you see, you, if we were just focusing on, on sign-ups per se, it would be, well, actually, at some point, it was like, why? We were getting a lot of sign-ups, but actually, we're not solving the rest of issues that should be solved by having more sign-ups. Um, but to get to that stage, it's not like, oh, yeah, we need to do verification. It's more like, wait, one second, so we have more signups, but still we have a lot of issues with people handling their bookings. Why though? Because we have more signups. And then it's like, wait a second, but why? Okay, we started to think about, well, to be able to manage your booking, you need to be verified because we're not gonna expose bookings to any, you know, if you are trying to log in, it will, maybe it will send you something, it will, it will send some, something to your uh, email address but it was a fake email address, for example, you would never get that. So that was one. The other one was uh, yeah, security. Like, uh, imagine that someone would take over your account on booking.com. We needed to alert you that, hey, it, there is a suspicious login here, but if it's, if it's uh, unverified email, you will never get it. Or at least we would not for sure know that that was the communication uh, or the best way to communicate with you. So. So by having, so we were doing this experiment, and it was after six months, and, and we needed to say, you know what, it's the KPI is not signups, so verified signups. That had a negative effect in terms of the numbers, for, because of course it's very easy to, I mean, you could even put a, you click a button and you can create an account. I mean, you can do that. You can gamify, or you can game uh, the metric if you, if you really want to. But verifying a sign up now is a harder step now we need to put even more uh, attention to the flow because it's not necessarily okay giving you the means to create an account it's giving you the means to verify it what if the what if you lost access to that email address can you verify with alternative methods facebook google i don't know that is connected to that email address for example um, so it shifted the approach that we had at the beginning, but also it shifted the, the, um, the focus and you know, the iterations. So it was not a hard stop. It was not like, you know, drop everything, switch. It was more like, OK, let's finish that experimentation line, and we start working on uh, signups. And me, as a program manager or, uh, at Booking, I needed to communicate this to like, the directors and say, hey, from now on, we are not going to measure ourselves in terms of signups. 
but verify signups and here's why and here's how it would affect your teams and here's why you need to look at that metric when you run your experiments and that's the other thing so at booking you don't know so you look at your own metrics and your own experiments but you also keep an eye on other people's uh, kind of or products metrics so for example if i um i was responsible also for the uh what's the name the um, the navigation bar at Booking, so the blue bar that you see on desktop as well. So that bar at the beginning has <laughs> entry points to a lot of teams. So for example, entry points to a lot of products by a lot of teams. So there, were, there was one product which was the discovery, um, like kind of like a discovery experience. And it was a very prominent link that in smaller screens, like it took a lot of space and no one actually was using that. So I was like, you know what, I, rookie mistake. I was like, let's run an experiment. And the hypothesis was that if we were to remove that link, people will be able to navigate, to actually go to the settings page or uh, sign in more because having more links and more options just drains your, your it's not your brain, but you have a higher cap, uh, cognitive load. So if, you, if I present you with 10 links, on a nav bar, you need to go and process each one. So the hypothesis was if we start removing, then people would have an easier time to actually go and find what they need to find, which was the two main areas like login, signups and all that. Um, so I removed that on the experiment. And I didn't have the um, kind of like the, yeah, at that time I didn't have the, the you know, the, the understanding of how removing something will affect other people's metrics. And then one day I did that and after like two, three days, the pro owner uh, at the, for that team, she was like, Elena. And I'm like, yeah. Did you remove uh, the entry point for the product? And I'm like, oh uh, yeah, we're running an experiment. And she's like, yeah, I saw a drop. I mean, of course, these experiments are always, um, it's not like 100% of the users, it's always contained. I mean, it's a experiment tool that manages the traffic very well and distributes the experiment. But she was like, yeah, I'm just, I just saw a drop. And then we, re we were uh, checking the experiment and I'm like, mm, yeah, I can see all her metrics were red on my experiment. So how do you solve this problem? Well, it depends how you want, what you want to achieve. But in the end I said, listen, but this is our problem. So the problem is that the users are on lab, um, small screens, uh, they are, we believe that they're having a hard time to understand where to go, especially because we have all these links. So our hypothesis is like by removing, they will get access and all that. So we agreed that, okay, we will not have the link there, but we will have it on the menu. And she was happy with this and it was not a massive. So basically that entry point hurt her metrics, but she was fine with the compromise. So then, also on the um, dashboard side, we were gonna have like a banner there. So she was gonna experiment on that, uh, on the dashboard. So that was the way to, and, and I learned from that experience that, okay, when I run experiments, I need to also check other people's uh, kind of main metrics. Of course, a booking conversion is kind of the main one because that's what's driving the business and also what they know that gives value to the customer. So when someone books a, a, a room, it's exactly what they want to do. So that's a good, uh, for them, it's like a good metric. And that's why that metric is so well understood by the whole company. And that's a way for everyone to get together. They get around the metric. Is this the best approach and will work for everyone? I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't think so because what if that metric doesn't fit different areas of the company, for example? But that metric was well understood. So everyone would run an experiment and then check, okay, well, it's not hurting conversion. Um, maybe we can you know, write it out to everyone. Or if it's hurting conversion, then you start having conversations like why and all that. So yeah, that's an that's a example. Yeah. Um, I've got a question about how do you manage inaccurate time estimates? when it comes to <laughs> developers? Right, right. Um, the answer is, I don't. <laughs> As in, so I don't, uh, what, I, what, I, what I learned to do, uh, I don't know if this will work for you, but I'll try it out. Um, after all this time, I learned that estimation is, uh, trying to estimate stories is also time that you invest of your development cycle. So if you have a team of, say, 10, 10 people, or let's say a team of four, 
then sitting down with them, trying to estimate the cards, that's time that you are investing in estimation. So what I learned is instead of obsessing about how, how accurate the estimation is, what it started to do is say, okay, this is a mobile app, so we have release cycles. So I said, we are going to start just having release windows. And I created, it's not an artificial deadline, but I just created windows. So I said, if we start working on this to solve, say, we are going to solve this problem, do we believe that this could go to this release or is big enough to go to the following release? So I, what I do now is, is this, is saying, is this problem something that you think can be released to users in two weeks or in four weeks or in six weeks? You know? So I give a, an, a, a time frame that they can go back, digest, and be like, mm, actually, I think this will go on the next release. So we have a, a different conversation. And this works for me because I have you know, all these teams work with me and I don't need to coordinate with other people, which was a different case than Condé Nast. Condé Nast, for example, they had, um, had three teams and like three project managers and I needed to coordinate with people like around the world and, I needed, and they, they had their own projects. So understanding when things were going to be ready was kind of super key for them. And the approach that we had there, I... I mean, we had that approach, but I don't think that for me would work uh, going forward. But the approach was, okay, we spend time, we invest time trying to estimate how many cards rather than story points was more like based on cards. And then you would have the program manager saying, okay, well, we could, this is our velocity based on previous sprints. And then it, it was just based on like, okay, we could do 90 cards per sprint. Therefore, it will take this, like, say, six months to deliver the whole thing. Um, I think that what happens with, for, and this is my point of view, I, I believe when you're like so obsessed about, tell me exactly how big the, the task is or how many story points, you are deviating from the actual, like, uh, from the actual feature or solution or, so you're having a conversation about when is it gonna be ready rather than is this the right approach for this, for this problem? And that, I don't know, I think that some developers would see this as a sign of, oh, it's so annoying to have to estimate all these things. I don't know because I don't have all the context. So if you do need to estimate, I would say keep it light and do a re-estimation if you can after a week or so after they started to work on the, product, uh, the problem or, or the feature because you know, it, it is very subjective because they might not have all the context or you don't have all the context. You, you might think like, yes, this is the thing that we need to do. And suddenly, oh my God, we find out that Instagram is, is launching this in a month's time. We need to actually speed this up and actually add something on top. I don't know, just making this up. But um, so yeah, for me, what has worked very well is the launch windows for, for mobile development. I guess you could do something similar for web development or something in which you can release all the time. Uh, but give them the power to decide or turn the conversation more into the, okay, these are the chances. Can we meet all this? Uh, when is the earliest that we can actually show this to users? And I work with developers that are super pumped and they really want to have things live. So it's also in their, I mean, they are motivated by launching things. So by giving them launch windows, they are kind of, it's, I don't know, like a, like a challenge, but they're like, hmm, I think we're gonna uh, you know, achieve this. And uh, yeah, I, so far, from all the things I have tried, this one for me has been the one that I actually can release things every two weeks. And I don't need to do sprints because the sprints are kind of artificial following the release uh, cycles. Mm, but I do, do, I do a bit of uh, planning, but not necessarily the planning in which everyone sits together like that. It's more like, okay, um, kind of like this is what we want to achieve. This is the part of the flow that we want to, to solve. We work together with the designer and designer, the designer works through kind of a proposed solution. They also get some input and then we start building. So uh, yeah, that works very well. Uh, but 
I, I imagine that if you need to coordinate with other teams, you do need to have a sense of when. So if you can create those windows and communicate those windows with people, that might be a way to move forward. Um, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. You told that you should uh, at least try to sell your product or do a customer success day if you can. Yes. What are your thoughts on your like using your own products? Because mm -hmm. by being a product manager, it's in our human nature that we could be very biased to our products yeah. and relationship between parents and baby. What, what are your thoughts? How to be you know yeah. unbiased with the product and yeah. the users? Yeah, I always think to myself, I am not the user, I am not the user, <laughs> you know, the, and to be honest, I always have that question to people that working at Facebook or something because they might be using Facebook and Instagram all the time. They're like, yeah, but we are not the, that kind of user anyway. But yeah, I always think I am not the user. So, and I try to, um, uh, try to, try find users that I can talk to, uh, try read about how users talk, uh, or how users are in their own forums. You can always find, for example, for travelers, you can go to forums, you can go to websites or blogs and things like that to, to see what they look for. Um, but as a, even as a reflex, every time I'm making a decision, um, it's like, or not a decision, but like when I'm like, oh, this might be interesting, oh, this is a great idea, I, I'm like, hmm, but would, would it be a great idea or would it be a great thing to solve for for say for a chef, uh, or for or for an ops person or a salesperson, so yeah, I just say I am not the user. And the other thing is like if I'm really really passionate about a problem or a solution, what is the thing that is making me think this thing like this way? Is it uh, something I saw from an interview? Is it something I saw on the data? Is it something that I don't know, an idea the CEO had? Uh, I can be like. Hmm, it sounds like a good idea, but is it really for the user? Is it, you, is it a good idea for us? Because we're the ones experimenting the pain of having to do this 10 times. But, and this is very common uh, for the operations team, uh, or for example, um, right now, because sometimes they're like, oh, it would be amazing if we can do all these things and da, da, da. And we put it on the product and I'm like, yeah, but the thing is that a real user would never even see the screen and would never even use the screen as you use the screen. So, so yeah, it's just like having that in mind. Like you are not the user, um, would for me works very well. And there, I'm never attached to, I am attached to satisfying who the customer is, but I'm never attached to the solution. Because if you are really attached to the solution, then you might not be even willing to change it. And uh, which, that's when I work with designers, for example, I'm like, it doesn't matter, like, don't worry, this will evolve. Right now it seems like a perfect thing, but it will evolve, so don't get attached to it. Um, yeah, so you can, you are free to move. Yeah. What kind of tools are used for experimentation? For experimentation, okay. So at at Booking, for example, they had their own uh, in-house uh, system, so they have the experiment tool. So that's, I mean, to get to that level, you do need a bunch of people in-house that can do kind of, they can do their own like tracking and ingesting data and all that. So Booking level experimentation is. You know, you have in-house team of I don't know. I don't remember how many people, like more than more than 30 people, working on the experimentation tool. Apart from that, consumer tools that you can get on, on the market. I've used uh, well, I haven't used it, like Optimizely, but I tried use Optimize from uh, Google. It was it was okay. Um, it, it allowed me to change things like copy or you know some some uh, UI stuff on the on the screen. Um, you can also do a, your own setup, for example, if you have things like um, Mixpanel, you can use Mixpanel to track uh, events uh, and you can also cluster users. Uh, there are tools like Phone with Flags, so there are some libraries that you can go and integrate and they have um, a kind of open source. So Phone with Flags, uh, there was another one that I used at some point, oh, I forgot. But Phone with, Phone with Flags was kind of Cheap, <laughs> cheap way of uh, starting to experiment and stuff because it's kind of feature flag. So you could define to this group of users, show this feature, to this group of users, show that feature, and then you can use uh, an online tool to uh, measure things like um, a statistic, a statistical power, how many users you need for that cohort. I mean, 
Mm. So you can be very, very cheap <laughs> or you can be booking style, which is like in-house. I, that, I have never used Optimizely, so I don't know if it's a good tool. I know that I have heard it's a bit expensive if you get to a certain threshold, I'm not sure. Uh, or you can use things like um, Google Analytics, but, but for Google Analytics, you need to make sure that you define the tracking correctly so you are able to see, um, you can define the dimensions and goals so you can see who is getting where uh, in, your, in your funnel, for example. Or, uh, yeah, mix panel. Mix panel um, has uh, interesting things like properties per event and has events. So you can just do an integration with fun with flags and mixed panel and then you can track people. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, mixed panel. And usually yeah. how much time do, do you provide for this experimentation? Do you have like a specific deadline when you try to achieve a sort of specific goal or um, what is the time frame? To, per, to do what, like to launch experiment? Yeah. And to leave the experiment running? Yeah. So to launch experiment, well, the time it takes to build experiments. So I don't know. For that, you, you need to talk to the developers. I mean, if there is something that is very time sensitive, you might plan ahead. But to leave the experiment running, it needs to, that's why I'm saying that there are some tools like calculators that you have online. But to run an experiment, you need to make sure that you have enough traffic and enough people to, to have a good reading, to make an informed, like a re, uh, real decision. So you need to have enough uh, users exposed to that experiments for you to say, oh, actually the effect was real. 